So I'll be uh, now trying to sum up uh, what has been learned since morning. Uh, in the morning, Elena and Paul laid down the foundation of the science of nutrition in pediatric oncology. Then you heard her, the practical uh, usage of enteral and parental nutrition in the clinic. When should we do it and what are the principles? Now the challenge in uh, low and middle income countries, especially where nutrition is not part of the normal culture, where it's difficult to uh, uh, manage because of the, the overwhelming burden of patients we face, is to how to adapt those guidelines and use it in our clinic uh, so that we manage each child optimally. So I'll try and summarize those uh, from behalf of the SIO PODC group, including some recent publications which we had uh, uh, published on this matter. So I'm going to focus on these uh, six aspects. First and the foremost, uh, which is critical for determining what to do is to know what we st where we stand at this moment. So assessing the nutrition services in the, in the institute and at the national level. Second is, how do we optimally assess a child with cancer? Third, how do we then define malnutrition? Because that's very important for then knowing where we stand today and knowing where we're going uh, in future. Defining uh, the risk group of these children so that we choose the optimal intervention algorithm. And lastly, what local strategies we can learn from each other and use it in our clinics, uh, which are most effective. And um, actually, quite uh, uh, actually, um, uh, happy to note uh, with the discussion we had with the previous uh, our Russian colleagues that uh, quite a detailed nutritional assessment and interventions are done in that clinic. So if that is a level of care in Russia, I don't think uh, we need to actually do much of nutritional education because the level is actually quite good. But our aim is to just try and get those uh, guidelines in place in your clinic so that you can further improve and refine those uh, interventions. So we, a SIO PODC did a survey of nutritional practices in low and middle income countries. This was published uh, two years ago, and it actually covered institutions from all across the globe, including from Russia. And what it clearly found was there was this uniform uh, uh, limitation with regard to finding the trained dietitians with finances pro providing nutrition, with other human resource and infrastructure, education, and of course other uh, manpower. And this was all across the globe, including from Europe. So what it clearly brought out was even in, uh, uh, in high income countries there's a huge heterogeneity with regard to provision of nutrition services and care. And when it came to uh, looking at the practice pattern and we looked at nutrition assessment first, there was of course a huge uh, heterogeneity in how the nutrition assessment is done. Of course, all centers used weight as the key determinant of uh, Assess, uh, nutritional status, which Elena talked about with her experience in Turkey. But what was clearly visible was that beyond weight, very few centers uh, uh, do other things uniformly. Uh, roughly two-thirds do some kind of assessment of height, weight loss, body mass index, dietary intake, and only a third actually do arm anthropometry, which is so easily doable, and actually I will come to that in the next slides, is a very sensitive marker of malnutrition in children with cancer. And using local survey helps. So for example, the survey in India actually showed us that they, where were the gaps in our care and where we have to build upon in the next few years. And similarly, a survey done in Russian institutes probably would help us plan the interventions at a national level. Of course, at the institute level, we have a SIOP framework which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So how do we assess a child uh, for its nutritional status? What is the ideal tool? and what is the basic minimum. So there is no gold standard because there is hardly any data correlating the nutritional status with one particular method with the clinical outcomes. So there is no gold standard, but of course, what is clearly visible is what is most sensitive. And because that will help us pick up the most at higher risk of nutritional associated complications and use that at least in your clinic so that you don't miss anyone with nutritional risk. And I'll come to that. So broadly, assessment tools are in four groups. Everybody knows this ABCD, which is anthropometry, biochemistry, uh, clinical assessment, and dietary history. In terms of anthropometry, we'll, we'll have a much more detail. In biochemistry, most of us know that beyond albumin, other measures are not so relevant in the clinic. They are good in the research setting. And even albumin has not been found to be consistently useful, except a large uh, recent Hopka study uh, from Central America, which showed that albumin could be useful. So it's a good thing to have because it's usually part of the biochemical assessment. Clinical assessment is very important 
a good clinical examination by a trained clinician can pick up so much more in nutritional status than any of the other measures can do. And of course, dietary is a critical part which can be done by nurses or by nutritionists depending on the availability of the healthcare resource. Coming to anthropometry, uh, we just had a discussion. There are many measures available, and most centers, unfortunately, just stick to weight. And weight is not a sensitive and a specific marker of uh, malnutrition because it's labile. It changes with the hydration status. If the tumor weight is significant, if it's more than 10% body weight, it's not the right marker to use for nutritional status. So vis-a-vis -vis weight, the other independent factors like weight for height or body mass index are far better. And even more better, of course, is arm anthropometry, and I'll come to that in my next slides. If we are doing weight, which most of us are doing, most centers don't have a longitudinal follow-up of that. So it's very good to have this WHO weight chart in the files to document the child's status at presentation and then in follow-up so that there could be assessment of whether there's ongoing weight loss or weight gain, and that both the things are very important to intervene at the right time, which I talked about in my last presentation also. But to define somebody as malnourished, what is more important is to actually look at the Z-scores. So if you are doing weight or BMI, look at the Z-scores, and which is again available from WHO charts, and then use these Z-scores to classify malnutrition in a uniform manner using the WHO charts, WHO, which is recently described. So if you're using weight for height and BMI, which is usually the most accepted uh, after arm anthropometry, you have the ones who are more than three standard deviation on the extremes were obese or see very wasted and rest are in between. So at least that puts the child into a clear defined standard category of nutritional status. Now, is BMI good enough? So there are many studies and we did recently a large study of around 1600 patients at our clinic and we found that across all tumor groups, the mid-arm circumference was far more sensitive than using BMI for picking up malnutrition. And overall, as you see, uh, if weight, uh, BMI picks up 40% children with malnourishment and mid-arm circumference actually almost double of that. So it's far more sensitive measure of malnutrition, especially in patients who have large tumors or, or on continuous intravenous hydration. This has been also confirmed in a large Central American study published uh, recently in 2012, which showed that, again, mid -arm circumference was far more sensitive compared to weight for height in terms of its sensitivity. So it's 12% with weight for height, which is 40% with the mid -arm circumference. Triceps skin fold thickness requires more expertise. It takes time. So in our study in India, as well as certain studies, it, it's not that additionally useful on top of mid-arm circumference. So if you have limitations in manpower, you could just do with mid-arm upper arm circumference along with BMI or weight for height. So based on this, uh, the SIO PODC group has recently published a framework uh, of adopt adapted nutrition therapy in low middle income countries. It's available free to download on pediatric blood and cancer. And it, based on our experience of working in LMIC, what we have chosen are the most simple and effective variables. So in children less than five years, if you have to choose one variable, of course, weight is usually available and BMI can be done, is mid-arm circumference. So that determines, puts the child into acute or severe acute malnutrition. Beyond five years, uh, of course, mid-arm circumference changes with age. Up to five years is fixed, so it's very easy to have a single cutoff. So if patient has uh, no major tumor mass, you could just use weight for height but if patient has a tumor mass, so that means the weight for height may not be appropriate, you could again use mid-arm circumference, and there are uh, normative values available published by Frisanko, which I will show you in the next slide. In centers, which are at a very low level, have no manpower, just nurses, social workers, this tape by Shakir, which is a very simple tape, which just has color codes, which puts the patient into normal, uh, moderate, and severe malnutrition just based on the color grades is a very effective tool. So if you're using mid-arm circumference, it's very important beyond five years to have normative values. And what is recommended is to use this by Frisanko, published recently, updated in 2008, which is accepted across the globe. What SIOPUDC recommends is that beyond BMI and mid-arm circumference is 
critically important for physicians to monitor the clinical science of malnutrition. And among them, the, one of the simple ones are looking at pediatric edema, which is a very sensitive science of severe acute malnutrition. Looking at uh, micronutrient deficiency is so much easier with respect to clinical examination than measuring vitamin Ds and uh, zinc levels. So some of these are so visible that they cannot be missed. Once we have assessed a child nutritionally, the question is how do we define the nutritional risk? Uh, there are tools which are available for screening in children uh, and adults as well. You've heard of subjective global assessment. There's a modified pediatric version called pediatric SGA. These are useful in children uh, otherwise, but in children with cancer, they have not been validated. So at this point in time, we don't have a great uh, generic tool available. What we know is that we have to take care of certain factors in mind. Uh, these Top three factors we usually do as part of nutritional assessment. We look at the anthropometry, albumin, we look at the weight loss in the recent times, usually more than 5% in last three months is significant. We look at the dietary intake in the last 24 hours or 72 hours, which is again very useful, can be done by a nurse. What we additionally want to know is what is a tumor type, what is the stage, and what is a planned treatment intensity. There is a scale available for that, but even otherwise, if you know the tumor type and the stage, it's very important to judge what is the nutritional risk. So I'll show you that in the next one. So the ones who are high nutritional risk are typically patients who have advanced cancers. That means they have high risk, the cancer called, for example, high risk neuroblastoma, or they have metastatic cancers. Or there are those tumors which usually get intense treatments despite being in early stage, for example, sarcomas. And lastly, the hematolymphoid malignancies like AML or high-risk ALL, which typically require intense treatments. So these are the in the high risk, and the low risk, of course, are the ones who require less intense gen gentle treatments, for example, standard risk ALL, retinoblastomas, Hodgkin's, and germ cells. This, this is not very difficult to classify. Beyond this disease uh, stage and the diagnosis, what is important is what treatments are planned. So if patient is planned for a major abdominal surgery, for example, in a neuroblastoma, if this planned for a uh, huge debulking surgery plan, or if you have a patient who's planned for bone marrow transplantation, that will upgrade this patient into high nutritional risk. If patient has a poor socioeconomic background with very poor social support system or access to food. Patient, despite being having otherwise a moderate risk, will turn into high risk because these patients are at a very high risk of becoming malnourished and at risk of death during treatment. So all these factors we take into consideration for defining the nutritional risk. Do we have a tool in pediatric oncology? We do have a screening tool. Recently, uh, PODC validated this tool uh, in uh, a small pilot study which has put these factors into six and scored them for their value. The first one, of course, we talked about the high-risk cancer. The children who will get intensive treatment, they get a score of one in each. If patients have gastrointestinal symptoms like severe mucositis or diarrhea or severe nausea and vomiting preventing optimal oral intake. If patient had poor intake based on their dietary attachment in the last one week. Patient had significant weight loss in the past, so it's Usually, there's no cutoff defined, but usually more than 5% weight loss in three months is considered significant. And patient shows any signs of undernutrition, clinical signs, like having bilateral pediatric edema. So having these scores guides you that what is a nutritional risk. If patient has more than three or equal to three uh, scores, then patient should be referred to dietitian. If it's, the, it's a general busy clinic, then this patient should be intervened early and further the nutritional intervention can be planned by the trained nutritionist. So question is, now we have assessed the nutritional risk and uh, we have to define the intervention. So what algorithm should we use? Elena talked about this children's oncology group algorithm which was developed way back 10 years ago in 2007. This is again based largely on expert opinion because there is very little evidence in our practice as to uh, which intervention is better than the uh, normal uh, other intervention. So A versus B, we don't have any evidence. Very little data which Elena showed on enteral nutrition benefit in pediatric oncology, very small studies. Again, there is no large trial comparing parental versus enteral. Of course, meta-analysis shows there's no benefit. So this is based on expert opinion, not tested or adaptable. It requires uh, huge manpower, and it's possible in high-income country, but not doable in low-income countries. Looking at this huge need, uh, PSYOP-PODC simplified this algorithm for use in 
low-income countries. And this is currently validated in four countries. Uh, and this basically has three steps. The first is assessing the risk. And this risk, which I sh shared with you, that you may use those six factors, but at the same time, if you can't, at least use mid-arm circumference. This just tells you patient into low, moderate, to high risk group. Once you define the risk, you could then define if patient is low risk, patient requires good nutritional education regarding food safety and hygiene, which is just enough. There is no need to be aggressive with neutropenic diet. Second is, step three is to define intervention in moderate to high risk. And if you look at this moderate and high risk, what it tells you is that the only difference between the two is the moderate risk basically are managed with either homemade or oral supplements, depending on what is available in that setup. There are many uh, uh, homemade good options, and Elena showed that in Brazil, many homemade options are equally beneficial and more cost effective. But if you don't have access to that, you could, uh, if you have access to uh, industrialized, you could use those supplements as well, it's typically in patients who have uh, gut problems like diarrhea. Now, if patient is high risk, typically we have to be more proactive because just trying oral feeds in those patients may put them at risk of progressive malnutrition and death. So we usually use proactive enteral nutrition in them upfront using enteral feeds and two feeding early on. And if there is no access to industrialized feed, we can use homemade enteral feeds in this situation. And there is a list of that available with this algorithm. If patient's gut is not functioning in both moderate and high, of course, we have to use parental nutrition and use components which are available uh, in the local setting. This Elena talked about when we're educating the care providers, we have to be very sensitive to their cultural and educational backgrounds. So what kind of foods are usually used in that culture? What are safe, what are not safe? What is the educational level of the providers? If the providers are not very educated, we have to have illustrated leaflets which do not require too much of uh, knowledge. And this she shared in detail and I will skip that. Coming to one of the local strategy which uh, group house found very effective is the use of ready-to-use therapeutic foods. Elena briefly mentioned those and I will expound on them a little bit more because I think that's very relevant. There are a lot of homemade foods. The challenge about homemade foods is that it does not have the balance of type 1 and type 2 nutrients. What we need is good amount of calories, proteins, but we also need a very good amount of micronutrients because that's very deficient in most of the uh, pediatric oncology population. And uh, Paul talked about that in her in the discussion as well, especially with zinc and other med. So RUTF is a UNICEF and WHO designed special a fortified food supplement which has a balance of both type 1 and type 2 nutrients. It's very calorie dense. It has more than 540 calories per 100 grams, 16 grams of proteins. It can be made locally in any setting. It can be, like for example, in India, it's being made in 20 different centers with their local machines. It's very inexpensive to make this. It can be stored at room temperature. It can be used immediately. It does not require any constitution. So it's one of the magic things which has been used for community malnutrition. This has not been tested directly in, in, uh, in the pediatric oncology population, and it's available with many different names. And in, I just showed, it's in some centers it's called Plumpy Nut, some is called Easy Paste, and in India it's called MNT, it's Medical Nutrition Treatment. So we did a study of that in our center in a randomized controlled trial, and that's ongoing still, and these are the early results, that the patients who are moderate, uh, moderate to severely malnourished upfront they were randomized to receive RUTF versus no RUTF in addition to the standard nutritional care which they're supposed to get. And at three months itself, there is a huge change in the RUTF arm. There is uh, Im uh, there's an improvement from moderate to severe malnutrition to normality in this group, vis a -vis and control group where there is only 30% patients who actually become normal uh, nourished at the end of intervention. What we also found interesting was that not only it improved the nutritional status, it decrease their risk of complications. There was decreased incidence of febrile neutropenia uh, to less than half of what the control group had at the end of uh, three months, roughly. And there were much lesser protocol delays in this group. Uh, there was only one patient who had protocol delay uh, after three months compared to 10 patients in that, which is roughly one-tenth of that. So it, although it's a small study and it's ongoing at this point, and this will have, of course, more than 250 patients, but it does show that this is a very useful thing to use in your practice. And this has also been found to be useful in previous paper published, non-randomized small paper from Malawi, and found to be very effective. So one is 
to use uh, insights from different places and uh, from guidelines to define what is your local SOP with regard to assessment, intervention, and uh, providing nutritional care. Other is to build up on that locally by doing locally relevant collaborative research. And I request you all to become part of COPODC. To join our group, we have a group which meets every uh, Thursday, third Thursday of the month uh, on Kyofo Kids. We have more than 100 members. I'm sure there are some from Russia as well to actually collaborate on the ongoing research so that you can build up on your local uh, 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 unique, uh, uh, you know, challenges and find the answers to them locally. And of course, uh, I encourage you to create a local stakeholder group. There is a similar group created with the help of COP in India, which has now NGOs, uh, centers, UNICEF, uh, other uh, providers which provide funding for the studies together on the same platform, working together to improve uh, nutritional uh, care in children with cancer in India. Lastly, as an institute, once we are working on developing the nutritional care in your center, uh, there needs to be some kind of structure in place. And SIOPDC has developed this framework uh, which is, again, I said, it's available to free to download, which tells you how to do it in three steps. The first step is to actually understand where you stand at this point in time by looking at your infrastructure and personal service. Now, the levels of care in this uh, framework are exactly similar to the SIOPDC levels of care for providing the care for different cancers. But we have specific nutritional level as well in this based on access to different products, provision of anterior uh, parental nutrition at this point in time. So once a center understands where you are at the level of, uh, uh, at which we say PDC level of care you exist in terms of provision of nutritional care. Second is what services you should deliver at that level. So that framework defines so that you can improve upon if you are deficient and if you are good, then you basically move on to the next level after working on uh, developing further infrastructure. And the last is, if you are moving up in providing nutritional care, how do you assess the impact of those interventions? And that's the third table in this, which clearly tells you impact variables for program reach for patients, as well as for efficiency of your nutritional interventions. So you are able to then objectively assess where you stood a few years ago, where you need, we need to be going, and then how can you uh, measure the impact of those interventions. My last request to all of you today is that we will be sending you a small survey on behalf of SIOP UDC to tell us what you would like in such kind of workshops as well as what kind of uh, deficiencies we had in the workshop so that we can improve upon them in our future workshops. And I'm sure we're going to have some in Russia in years to come. So thank you very much on behalf of SIOP UDC. <laughs>